Good morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer today. Now. Lord, we desire to order the affairs of our heart right now to be good ground. That what we take hold of and what we lay hold of today goes in deeply that it engrafts itself into our innermost parts by faith and not be lost. Lord, we thank you that you have given us your great and precious word who came to us in the flesh and announced you to us that he is our Lord and Savior. And we thank you for it, him by whom we have life and life everlasting. This word as it goes forth is being proclaimed from the rooftops, announced to all who have ears to hear. And I praise you for this time, Lord, that the airways be clear from all hindrance, from all meddling of the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Theron Cole, and I am coming to you from Believers Foundation Ministries. Uh, there is a BelieversFoundationMinistries.com, but you can reach us on YouTube, which is probably where you are reaching us. So, there you are. All right, moving on. Uh, this teaching today is going to be what it's going to be. And uh, the Lord is going to direct as he always does. Puts it together. Go with great skill. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> it is very hard for me to get past and to go on beyond teaching on the pride of life because I find that to be probably one of the most, well, all of the tests that our Lord suffered on our behalf at the beginning of his ministry, the sifting that was done, the poking about in his soul that was done by the enemy. Those three tests are the challenges that we have to overcome. We have to overcome them all, and we have to overcome them exactly the way he did. So, I think people read the scriptures and they think that that is easy, because reading the scriptures is relatively easy. Embracing it is not so easy. Doing it is even less easy. God is about the heart and he's about being what he says. He is real. He is truth. And he is our life. And what's interesting is that um, it has not escaped God's attention that we are in this time a people that speak broadly throughout the world in English just because God spoke things in times past doesn't mean that he didn't speak to us now because he is speaking to us very much now. So it's fascinating to me that since I do consider him the God of what is real, and he is, and he's the God of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That means God is too because God and he are one. But I find it fascinating that Israel is called Israel. <laughs> that's amazing to me. So when you say it in English, that's exactly what it says. Israel. It's beautiful. It's the way it sounds. Praise God. God has a magnificent humor at times. Okay. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 8.
Now what the Lord is doing here is that he is, actually we're going to start up a little bit further back. He's sending out the twelve and Jesus gives them the following instructions and I'm going to cut into this a little bit. He tells them initially uh, not to go down certain roads. He's not, they're not to travel certain places, not to go onto the road of the Gentiles or to enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Interesting that. This is what we're to be seeking, the lost. Those who are the lost of God, the lost of the house of Israel. Because once you receive the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is who he is, and among that and other things, but he announces himself in that manner clearly so that we know that those three men had examples with God that typified exactly concerning his nature. And each one of them demonstrated through their lives the nature of God. So he, and they were sowing by the promise what God wanted them to sow into the earth. Now that sowing of their deeds and their words began to make the way. It was started long before them though. They were part of a major process whereby God brought forth the Christ. Now he tells them to go to the lost of the sheep of Israel. So when we, and Paul says, we as former Gentiles, because that's not what we are anymore if we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior in truth, we are grafted into Israel. So we are also to seek the lost of the house of Israel. This doesn't mean that you become Jews. The Jews are who the Jews are, magnificent that they are. But there is a birthright that began to come in the natural as part of God's revealing his plan and Israel agreed to do this way long ago through her ancestors, though the descendants may not necessarily have been on board, which is, of course, what we saw when Jesus came back. There were a lot of them that weren't on board. And, but what he's doing through Israel is prophetic, which is what God does with all of his people, ourselves included. But when you're up too close to the work, it's very difficult to see what's being done. God has to reveal to you what's even being done through you, or God has to reveal to you a lot of what you think you see because you're, we're up too close and because our natural minds lack understanding. So we need insight. We need God's insight, God's wisdom. So we are also seeking the lost sheep of Israel, the house of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Well, the sick often are easy to see. They don't feel well. They've been given a death diagnosis. They are not managing to keep up with life as it is. The sick are a little clearer to see, but not all. Much that is sick doesn't seem sick. God says at one point in the scriptures that your wound, he said, is incurable. Well, they didn't know that. 
what happens to an incurable wound? That means there's nothing that can be done for it in the natural. But with God, all things are possible, Scripture tells us. The wound was incurable when Jesus came, but he healed it, and he cleansed the land. So what we are to do is by the teaching and the preaching of this word of God, this magnificent, supernatural, powerful word, which is able to rightly divide between that which is wholesome and that which is unwholesome, that which is clean and that which is unclean, that which is healthy and that which is diseased. The word can do this, rightly divide and rightly sever off from that which is clean. Now, Jesus spoke to his disciples when he was here and he said, you are already clean now because of the word that I've shown you. But he said when he was doing the foot washing thing, but this has to be done. Now he says, you're to do this for one another. How we do that for one another is we fellowship. We teach each other. We teach each other the word of truth. We teach each other the revelations that we receive from God. And that thing that we hear in secret from God, we shout from the rooftops. We share with our brethren. We share that with those who have ears to hear. This is powerful because this keeps us clean as we walk, walk along in the world. You see that dirt when it gets on the soul as we accumulate it through the world. It doesn't seem like it's much of anything. A little here, a little there, but we're accumulating something that's making our heart hard. It's actually pulling us away from God. We're like little salmon swimming against the current. And we can't hold that strength against the current without the Word of God regularly applied to us. And we need it in the form also of the brethren. So this is a, the reason why you have to have others around you who have understanding of the word of truth. If you don't spend time hanging out at some point with the children of God and with those who have some understanding, real understanding of the Lord, which is deeper than the understanding of the flesh those who are spirit-filled. If you don't hang out with a few of them, and it doesn't take a lot, actually, one will do. You can fellowship concerning what God is giving you in such a way that you keep yourself clean from the world. And it continues to enable the yeast of heaven, which is what we'll be discussing some of today, and the yeast of hell, which is a real thing, off of you, keeps the yeast of heaven fomenting from you, which it does and it will if the Word of God stays in your heart and does its work through your heart. It will continue to grow and it will continue to work its way out, but it can be choked. It can be, it can be rendered useless by the weight of the things in the world, and you don't actually know it's happening. See, I think a lot of Christians think that they'll know, or when they reach that point where they're kind of, uh, what do we used to call it, backslidden, that they're going to know this. Well, they may at some point know it, but at the point that you begin to realize that it's been going on a long time, and what what have you lost in the process? Well, quite a bit, actually. And the truth of it is, it's not just what you've lost. It's what others around you have lost. It is a, it, it is a crime. And that's the truth. It's a spiritual crime to lose the word of truth in your heart. And many suffer the loss of it. It keeps us poorer as a body. That word of God in our heart that manifests and continues to foment is a wealth. It's a richness. Thank you, Lord. So, raise the dead. <laughs> now, this is a good one. 
Well, I don't actually have a whole lot of opportunity to raise the dead. Uh, we don't, our practices in this culture make it so, it's kind of hard to even get to the dead. And, uh, and if you go to a funeral, it's a closed casket and the family's got it, I mean, it's shut down and you're just not going to be able to get to it. Much less to that, you won't be able to get to that body. But there are many dead. So rejoice. The dead are all around you. Fact of the matter is, we are among the walking dead. Every time you go anywhere in the world, you're coming into contact with the dead. Now the dead are unclean. That's a given. And so unclean, in fact, that in the Old Testament, any contact with a dead body at all required a series of cleansing washings. It was something that God wanted his people to be alert to, that contact with the dead was unclean. Also, they were not allowed to have the Gentiles in their homes, the Jewish people. They were, God says, you be separate. Separate, what were they separating from? They were separating from the unclean Gentiles. The Gentiles were very unclean when it came to what God wanted. They were dead people, most of them. Not all, eventually. Some came when Jesus was walking. Some came to him, even though he didn't come for them at that time, he said. And yet, much of what he came to do spilled out. <clears throat> and many were the recipients of his glorious visitation upon this earth. Wonderful. He's still visiting upon the earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right. So the dead. There are many of the walking dead around us. And they enjoy trying to feel alive. They are imitators of life because they don't actually have life. And many of them are frantic, absolutely frantic, to display aspects of life, challenging the parameters of what life is by doing death-defying acts. Those are the most Colorful, I suppose. I know a few weeks ago I described uh, Evil Knievel a little bit. I don't know if Evil Knievel was saved, but I, I can't imagine a saved person would behave like that. But there is a kind of franticness among a lot of the dead. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no peace in their life. So they're constantly fomenting a kind of restlessness. They're not happy people because they have no life in them. Some of them are desperately looking and some of them may become saved, but of course not all. It's the way it is. But each of us do what we're told to do, and the lost of the house of Israel are coming in. Praise the Lord. So the dead, raise the dead. How do you raise the dead? You preach the word, you tell them the gospel, they become saved, and they're no longer dead. You have raised the dead. That's what salvation is, really. <laughs> it's a raising of the dead. You know, I used to describe it this way when a person got saved. I would say, before this, you were a paddle boat on the water. But now you're a hydroplane. You have no idea how fast you are. You have no idea the power that you have and you have no idea how dangerous you are. You cannot live the life of the saved without the Lord right at your side because we know none of those things. So to go off half-cocked and to launch on life with your flesh once you've been saved by the Spirit is dangerous and deadly a lot of times. So we have to learn then how to rein this flesh in, how to gain ascendancy, a domination, um, overcome the flesh by the Spirit of God, with God, right at our side, teaching us, giving us wisdom and insight the whole way, 
because we are saved when the Spirit of God touches our heart and He now is in us, but we are becoming saved in our soul. And that's a process. We are becoming saved. So we need Him to walk alongside of us to assure and uh, ensure this process. Now, as Paul said, we don't want to neglect such a great salvation. So we want to attend to these affairs because this is our life. He is our life. Uh, it's not the company that we work for. Uh, it's not the family that we serve in this world. It's not uh, our friends and our activities. Our life is in Jesus Christ. And he needs to be preeminent, preeminent in everything. And that takes time too. Getting that word of truth down deep enough, pervasive enough, strong enough. As you become more real, you become more filled with him. He always makes you more real, more truthful, more truth, more truth, more truth, more truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says. And he was telling us the truth. These are all words that are hard to embrace because so many people have an interpretation on them. They have an interpretation of the way they're supposed to live their life, and it's usually by the example of people around them who don't have much of a life in the Lord. So we're not to allow that standard to be our standard. The two spies that went in from Moses' camp, Joshua and Caleb, who came back with a good report, they were the only ones who came back with a good report. It was a report given not in fear. It was a report given in keeping with the Spirit of God. Those two were the only ones who were able to resist the pull in that camp to go the way the rest of them were going complaining, mouthing off against God and Moses. and God had to wait until they were all dead before he could actually do anything. They were not permitted to go in. But both Joshua and Caleb did. Praise you, Lord. Cleanse the lepers. You know, I've been looking for lepers, and in my world, I don't find them. They're not there. So what are the lepers? Well, I would have to say that there are genuine lepers in certain parts of the world, just not in my part, and they're to be cleansed. We apparently have the power to do that. Myself, personally, this remains untested because I have not had an example upon which to cleanse. But there are many unclean people around me, and that includes people who name the name of Christ. I have walked into churches and I can feel the uncleanness. And what is that? Well, there's not a whole lot of word being taught there. The people are not compelled to spend much time in the word. It's the word of God that cleanses you. Jesus himself said, you are now clean. He said, because of the word that I've given you. Well, if you don't get much word, you're not going to be clean. You're going to be dirty. That world is going to stick to you. And if that's the case, what happens is that your ears are dull and your eyes can't see very well. They're off. You may see a little bit better than you did before you were saved, but it's not going to be a whole lot. And everything's going to be skewed by the uncleanness that you are walking in. You have to become clean. Only the Word of God does this. You can't get clean by scrubbing your house down. And I know there are some women that I do know, and men too actually, that are quite obsessive about cleanliness. And they will scrub, 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 scrub their house. But they spend no time in the Word of God. So their houses are clean but their souls are dirty and they don't know. So we're told to clean the leper, cleanse the leper. All right, so these are things 
that we can do all of these things, drive out demons, the demonic, through the pure teaching of the word, by revelation, cannot abide it. They will leave. That's one way of driving them out. The really stubborn ones, the really stubborn ones, and there are a few of those, those are people who've accustomed themselves to sitting and listening to the word of truth and not acting on it. Time after time after time, they sit through teaching on the word and they don't act on it. It's not mixed with faith. And if there's a demonic presence there, that demonic presence gets very stubborn in that person. So that demon can be driven out, but only with the permission of the person person has to give permission. The person's got to know the demon's there. And what I've seen with a number of Christians, and oh, this is quite a debate. This one is a fabulous debate. Well, I just don't think Christians can have demons. Oh, well, you think wrong. Truth is that the demonic realm, the demons, those spirits who manifest in attitudes, this is how they manifest. They will, one way that they manifest, they will take whatever territory they're given. So you give a demon territory in your life as a Christian and he really finds Christians juicy because he's got a bit more power to work with there. I have seen many Christians operating in a position of power in churches through the spirit of witchcraft. And it is so depressing to see this and it makes me angry. I've seen demonic people given over to full demonic possession, standing in a place that should be occupied by a man of God. And what is vastly fascinating to me, never ceases to stop amazing me, is how many friends people like this have out in the world or in the church. People that are tyrants, given over to wicked spirits. Nasty, nasty pieces of work. But they've got enough going on by which to convince themselves and the people around them, hey, you know, that they're really nice people. Maybe they've got a few hangups in a few areas, but you know, they're just really nice people. The justification of people around people like this is astonishing to me. Frightening, actually. The willingness of so many people to believe that somebody that is operating outside of the way that we were told in the Word to behave is somehow capable of being justified and supported in their behavior in a setting that affects other children of God is astonishing to me. So the Lord rebukes this practice, talks about it in Revelations when he addresses the churches, and he tells them in one particular church, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now, that entity Jezebel is a personality that's taken on. It's an attitude of behavior that usurps the authority of others, usurps it. Now, I've heard some people, I've you know, read a number of books on this, finally stopped doing that a few years ago. Um, you would think there, there's, you would think that just a strong woman is a Jezebel. Well, that's not true. Jezebel has a very distinct personality. She's a dominator. She dominates over other people. She considers herself superior. And I don't mean confident in God. That is a completely different matter. I have tremendous confidence in God. And there are those that would challenge that as a superior thing. Okay, well, a lot of women who have confidence in God are that way. They'll project a strength that those who are, in fact, competitive and jealous will try to take down. That is not what I'm talking about. 
I'm talking about someone who actually dominates the souls of other people, takes them over in one way or another, literally. But it's all done under the guise of We've heard about churches, most of us, uh, often it's cults that will dominate the lives of other people and basically in the end generally ruin them. That's usually what happens. When a person's choices and the life that God intends a person to live are uh, forced, extorted, to be arranged under another person as an adult, this is a wicked thing. It's witchcraft is what it is. But the Jezebel, the true Jezebel, usurps power. She takes power that isn't hers and uses it. Now all of this can be done under a certain guise. And I've known, I have known people like this. And the attitude is this, oh, I had no idea. Oh, uh, is that what, oh, did I do that? Oh. But see, they do it a lot. They're, they're taking here and doing this. And what they believe at their core is that the ends justifies the means. So if they believe that they have a good idea uh, and they don't have a consensus or they don't have the word of God behind them, but it's an idea they hold, they will run with it and work it out and uh, be numb or deaf to the consequences. Those don't matter. Now that's just one little part of a Jezebel. But the amount, because we're not going into that in this, the amount of favor that people who are dominators of the souls of others who are controlling and manipulative, the amount of favor that they receive by the people around them even, even amongst the Christians, frightens me, frightens me that people are that easily led astray by lies. That's disturbing. So how is that? How is that? How is that that they're like that? Well, they uh, exhibit their lack of Christian character. That's for one thing. Not only does the Jezebel lack character, but uh, her followers do too. Now, one other thing that we are told in the word about her is that her followers practice a sexual licentiousness. So these are, these are workers of seductiveness and they continue to fall into immorality. But they, you know, oh, you know, they just couldn't help themselves that time. And, you know, that there was a reason for it the other time and, and, you know, on and on and on until how many of these little bribes will you take in in order to be okay with what the Jezebel is doing? Or someone who is acting badly may not be a full-blown Jezebel, but just a really bad actor. How far are you willing to go to let them remain lawless before the word of truth that you happen to know they're breaking persistently? How far? Well, that's a test of your character. See, it's not just their character that's being played out here. If that's going on around you, that's a test of your character. At what point do you say something? And then at what point do you disengage yourself and have no part? Have no part of what they're doing after you've rebuked them. See, this is all about our Christian character, which we are to be developing as the word of truth takes root in our heart. There's an actual character that's being developed here, a strength. A strength by which your life as you know it is becoming entwined until your life in the flesh as you know it has been sold 
completely over to the Lord Jesus Christ or bribed into kowtowing to a demon. That's what we're dealing with here. This is not, this isn't candy land and it isn't something that isn't around us all the time. These elements are around us all the time. And yet, in talking with people, I have met people who can't see any of this. Well, usually people that can't see any of it are so steeped in it that the price that they would have to pay on their own soul to get out of it, they can't even fathom it. And so they are sold out to the enemy. Now these people claim the name of Jesus. At what point, at what point have they actually sacrificed what they think they got from God as they move over into the enemy's camp? See, I don't know what that is for each person, but I know that there's a point. I know that there's a point when what you think you have, you don't have anymore. That you can't continue to compromise your Christianity and keep it. You can't. It's impossible. And yet I see people trying to do it all the time. I see people trying to figure out, I guess, just how close to the edge of, of that they can get and still be okay and maybe get into heaven. What? Yes, there's people who live like that in their attitude. They don't know they're doing it a lot of times. A lot of times they don't know. Some people actually know, but most of them don't actually know because they never question themselves. They never let God talk to them. They keep themselves too busy or they are so quick with their justifications that they don't give God a chance to actually speak to their heart. There's all kinds of different ways you can interrupt the words of God. He does talk all the time to us. He is constantly talking to us. You can be in a constant dialogue with the Lord. And that's true, because I've done it. Constant. You keep yourself focused on the Word of God. He's going to be talking to you. He is going to be talking to you. He's going to be talking to you through that Word. He's going to be talking to you in your heart. That groundwork is never, because He's alive. And the Word of God, when activated in your heart by faith, is alive. It's not a dead thing. It's alive. This is our life. Anyway, I have to get into this more because the Word supports itself in all these matters. And it needs to be supported. Because eventually, the conviction of your heart needs to have the support to come to a conviction of the legality of it by having heard what the Word of Truth says from our Lord, the Apostles, the Prophets, because they will support the truth enough so that we are without excuse. And that's a good thing. Okay. Now he says here, drive out demons. Okay, so we're finishing this up. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Thank you, Jesus. Over here in Proverbs 4, uh, in about chapter 5, I think. I mean, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, we can go back a little bit. This is a father's instruction. Well, you know, this isn't some generic... Uh, dad who's deciding to write to his sons and it doesn't have anything to do with you. That is so not true. This is your father talking to you. This is your father talking to you. Pay attention and gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. We're we'll start we're in verse 2 here. Do not abandon my directive. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only child of my mother, he taught me and said, 
let your heart lay hold of my words. Do you know this is what our Lord was taught too? Our Lord read all these words many, many times. You know, there's a lot of people that want to go to Israel to walk in the places where Jesus walked. Well, these are the places where he walked. This is the heart of our Lord. He had to find himself in these words, and he did. He found his identity here. He found his instructions here. He found everything that he needed to live the life that he did and to do the things that he did, he found in here, as well as the Spirit of God right with him, instructing, urging, reminding as he went along. He had a good friend with him, and so do we. The very best friend that you'll ever have in your whole life is the Spirit of God right with you. That is the Spirit of our Lord leading and guiding you according to his word. He taught me and said, <clears throat> let your words, let your, mm. now that's interesting. I was going to say, let your words lay hold of my words, which was wrong, but actually probably pretty true too. Let your heart lay hold of my words. Keep my command, my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will preserve you. Love her and she will guard you. Wisdom is supreme, verse seven. So acquire wisdom, gain understanding, prize her and she will exalt you. Well, I've read in the word where we're told that God will exalt us in due time when we're in struggles and whatnot. Well, God is wisdom. This is the wisdom of God. What is that? That's his instruction. It's his understanding. So really in the King James, it says, in all you're getting, get understanding. And I have something else to say about that one. We have been told, freely you've been given, freely you've received, freely give. Now that was in Matthew. Freely you've received, freely give. Well, if in all you're getting, get understanding, then in all you're giving, give understanding. Endeavor to impart what you've heard in secret. Endeavor to impart what you've heard in secret from God to others. They need it. This is water of the soul. This is the water by which when we drink this regularly, we never thirst again. And you say, well, how can that be? How is that even possible? Well, I know this for a fact. He will support you in all of your needs and you'll not lack for anything. There is a point of sufficiency that the word supplies when it's in your heart, in abundance, having taken root, in abundance, you lack for nothing. He keeps you safe. I've had it happen. I've had a few attempts on my body that never came to fruition. The enemy dropped his arms and walked away or I was led in a way that kept me safe, right in the presence of the enemy. The Lord says in the scriptures, it is written, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Well, that's not gonna be in heaven, that's here. A table, what is that? A place of feasting a place of eating. What is that? A place where wisdom and instruction are available to you. A place where you receive the choice morsels of the land. A place of real food for the body and real food for the soul 
and your life gets what it needs, a table, a table of provision. He's lavish, God is. You can't read the lives of those old prophets and of, and of the men of God who followed him, Lord, and see anything other than lavish. When he lays out in Leviticus and in other scriptures through Moses about the priest, you begin to realize that the priest is not going to be able to have anything in the natural, but he has everything from the people. The people have to put the food, they get the choicest cuts, the, the places where they live, there are places apportioned to them, it's given to them. They don't have to sweat by their brow to get it. And each of the tribes are embedded with the Levites. You see, you, you, when you begin to actually understand what the priests were given, what looks like poverty isn't poverty at all. It's a different kind of prosperity given by God. Okay, now this is really good to catch. So what the natural testifies of is the spiritual. It's a testification, I call that. It's a testification of the supernatural. That's what the natural is. But if we only focus on the symbol or the sign and not the real, if we don't question what's behind this, what is my Lord saying to me? What is the real thing? You're going to accept the yeast of hell in favor of the yeast of heaven. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here. Powerful stuff. The yeast of heaven is. That's what the priests were to enjoy. They were eating the best of the land. They were living in places that were given and not having to get it by the sweat of their brow. And what they had to do was to stand before God and on behalf of the people intercede, which is what we are to do. Now that we have accepted him as Lord and Savior, we are now ordained by that acceptance as intercessors. Well, that's what he's doing. That's what our Lord is doing all the time now. He's interceding for us constantly. And we are to intercede for others in prayer and in our life in every way. So we reach out to the lost. We create a bridge for those who have been lost to God and need to come back to restore. We continue to press out and give what we've been given to keep those that are barely hanging on or those who need more or those who just need what you've got to give because your life, this precious life that you've been given, there are people who need to hear what you have to say and need to receive what you have to give who aren't going to get it from anyone else but you. So you are crucial in the field that you live in. Now we spent some time a few weeks ago concerning the field that we've been given. These were, this was under the topics of the pride of life. And one of the, um, the kingdom of heaven gives you a field. You have a field in the kingdom of heaven. This is opposed to the pride of life. The pride of life will keep you from your field that God has given you. God has given you a field. Now Abraham, the father of our faith, was given a field. God took great care to let him know that this was a field that he was going to, he could see as far as your eyes can see. Well, hopefully Abraham 
Abram, and he was given that when he was still Abram. Hopefully he had good vision. I believe he did. He could see far. And he was told that as far as he could walk, well, Israel isn't a very big country, but then apparently Abraham, Abram, uh, as he was known then, um, he wandered quite a bit and walked quite a bit, but that's the territory. God had said to him after Lot separated from him, which is what God wanted him to do in the beginning anyway, when he said to him to leave his family and come out, but he couldn't let go of Lot. Does that sound like any of us? Oh, yes. But not until he let go and not until what God had requested was done could God then begin to talk to him about his field, his field. So he then lays it out. He says, take a look around you. And that was right after Lot left. Take a look around. He said, as far as your eyes can see, as far as you can walk, he said, I'm giving this to you and your descendants forever, forever. So we have something in heaven that's right here, our field that we were given. And it will not be able to be seen and you'll not be able to walk it out until you begin to realize where you're held captive by the world and disengage. And then that field begins to, begins to manifest. You begin to see it. It's a territory of working. And I'm going to say this for most people, this field that you've been given, contrary to what the world tries to teach you about, think big, imagine anything. Oh yeah, just get right out there into the devil's territory. <laughs> Go for it. It's actually pretty small. Jesus says, put my yoke upon you. He says, he says he's easy. And he said, my burden is light. This territory that you've been given is very deep and generally fairly small. Very often with a woman, not always, but very often with a woman, it will be her children and her husband. And her job is to keep them clean. And she'll teach them. Your territory just isn't as big as the world is going to try to make you think. Very often the world tries to get you to leapfrog over what God has given you into this vast, you know, people waiting to, to be recognized by Hollywood. And it's all the yeast of hell. Now there are people that step into that for one reason or another, but that's a dangerous place to be, that place. Very dangerous. And it claims a lot of souls, not for God. Not only in the workings that they do there, but also in the product that they produce. Captures a lot of people, takes them captive. Plus it's got a philosophy too. Now there are some powerful works to support the kingdom of heaven that have come out of Hollywood. But they are so few, so few, but they've come out. I've seen a few and they're incredible. But that medium is predominantly not in control at all of the children of God. It's dangerous. But a lot of the attitudes that our culture now embraces have come out of that machine. And it, I hear them in churches being taught, just imagine whatever. Where's that imagination going to be coming from? It's going to be coming out of your flesh. It's not coming out of the Spirit of God. I, I don't even remember the last teaching I ever heard, if I ever even heard one. I've gotten them from the Holy Spirit on how to hear God's voice, how to capture that place where God's voice speaks to you. Now that place where only God talks to you 
can be violated by witchcraft. I've had it happen. You got to know when it when it's been violated, there's something in me that goes, "What?" Because that place is for God. Only God talks to me in that place. I call that place Zion. The place where God talks to me. Now there is a natural Zion. In Israel. This I believe and have believed for some time is Zion in truth. And God desires to take us somewhere. But this place where he's taking us, he hasn't given us a map for. It involves a great deal of trust and our faith is required to get to that destination. He can't tell you where it is because it's eternal and because there's no map there. It involves your heart. This is why the fruit of the Spirit is so vital to the work that you do. A lot of people don't want to mess around with the fruit of the Spirit because they want to go, well, it's just, you know, the work. Well, the work is not the fruit. It is a type of fruit, the work, but it has to come from a heart that's filled with fruit. If the heart isn't fruited, the work will be tainted. The work has to be done from a fruited heart. So that is also the field. Even to the point where the Word of God calls the heart the ground, the good ground. So you begin with your own heart. That is the field to begin with. And that begins the work that you need to be engaged in concerning the yeast of heaven, which multiplies, multiplies. So when Jesus, when the story that we hear about our Lord, where he sits down, he has the people on the hills sit down and he takes the loaves and fishes and he multiplies them. He takes them and lifts them up, blesses them. Now he does this miracle that we have the information of twice. Now there are other indications in the scriptures through the prophets of the yeast of heaven, but Jesus does other things too. The yeast of heaven is in manifest. God's yeast is to multiply freely. His thanking God for what he was given and using what he had, multiplied it to thousands of people. And when they picked up the baskets, there were leftovers that filled baskets. It's just incredible. It was an abundance. It was lavish. God knows how to set a table. The yeast of heaven. So that's what we want. But it all these things, you see, start with us having our own field that we work in, that we enable then God to work through us in that field, that field of endeavor that he has given us. Now we're told by the parables that God teaches concerning the kingdom of heaven. Our Lord taught repeatedly concerning the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like it's like this, it's like that. It's like, a, it's like a man who goes into a field and finds a treasure, buries it back up again, goes and takes everything he's got, sells it for that field. Because it, that field is going to cost you. That field is going to cost you. Now, the cost, initially, you can't fathom. Just know this. It'll take everything you've got. You have to be willing to give everything you've got. The other thing is that I've learned is you may not be required to give it physically. 
but you are giving it. It, has, it is not on you to own, and you know that. That is something. That is you taking up your cross. Jesus talked about taking up your cross before he had gone to the cross, and I wondered if that confused the people around him. They wouldn't have known what it meant. He was sowing seeds right then for his death so that when he died, people would begin to understand, those who had ears to hear and eyes to see, what he had said. He was prophesying about his death. And I'm just going to read that right now. That's in Galatians chapter 2. Well, actually, no, that one's not in Galatians. Let me go here. Um, Matthew, well, we were already in Matthew 10, but Matthew 10... starting in about verse 16. Behold, now he's talking to his apostles here, or his disciples. Behold, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd. In other words, you pay attention. There is danger all around us. Pay attention attention. God will talk to you through dangerous moments if you listen to him and he will direct you away. Or as I had happen one time, standing face to face with somebody in a parking lot that was hunting and apparently I was the prey. I don't know if I should tell this whole story right here. I had somebody follow me out into a parking lot. I had, a, I had to be in the store for a period of time, and at that time I was living in a place that was extremely hot, temperature-wise, really hot. And I was on my way out to the car to get a chicken that I had bought because I couldn't leave that chicken in the car very long, but I was going to be in that store for a little while because of some things I had to do there. And as I had walked out to get to my car, someone began to follow me, a large male. Now, I knew when this individual began to follow me by the Spirit of God that that person was following me, but I didn't want to believe it. So I kept saying to myself, I don't want this to be happening, but I believe I know that this is happening. <laughs> the Spirit of God was telling me that he was following me. So I accepted that he was following me, and I was listening in my heart for God. No fear. I was just listening. I was absorbed in listening for what God had to say as I continued to walk out to the car. Now I began to realize, because I could hear his steps and all, that he was starting to flank me. And then God spoke to me, and he said this, Don't show him where your car is, and you have to deal with this now. Now, when God tells you to do something and you accept it, you will know instantly what to do. This is not going to be kept secret from you. I planted my feet, and I turned and faced him. And this is how it went. I didn't say a word. But the power of God came up in me and out my eyes. And that man looked at me and I looked at him. And our vision was locked for probably maybe 20, maybe 30 seconds. We stood there and faced each other off in that parking lot. And the power of God gave no entry for whatever was in him to have me. It was so strong. I was filled with tremendous confidence in my God. And I stood there, and he never varied. I don't know if we blinked. We must have. But there was an exchange and a deep conversation at the end of which, without words, 
it was like something dropped in him. I would have to say it, it felt like his arms dropped, but his arms weren't up. And then he turned around and walked back to the store. And after he was gone a sufficient distance and I couldn't see him, I then proceeded onto my car, got my chicken, and went back to the store. Now I reported this to the manager of that store, only to discover that the truly dangerous portion of that event was the manager, who refused to act on it, took it lightly, and said how fortunate I was because had it been in the morning, they'd had many carjackings. Well, that's basically what was about to occur. And the manager had not followed through to call the police, which is what I had recommended initially. See, I had told him that when I came in, or I told, told the, the story to be given to the manager, and then the manager reported that it had not been done. I said, you have a predator here. And I said, he's hunting. Anyway, I was so discouraged by that, I didn't do what I should have done, which is to follow through with the police. I should have gone ahead and called. Many are the concepts that you have later when a situation like that. I would know better next time, right? Hopefully there won't be a next time. One was enough of those. God took care of me. Out of the abundance of my heart, the word of truth came forth, and the enemy couldn't stand it, had to flee. Resist the enemy, and he will flee. Well, what do you resist him with? You resist him with the word of God, because that's got to be in you, in abundance. It's got to be the word you believe, not the word that you've heard, the word that you believe in truth the word that you trust, but you have to work it. You gotta keep at it. It takes diligence, it takes time. This doesn't happen overnight, often. What I'm saying is there's a happening that occurs overnight when he comes into your heart and you are transformed, and there's a happening that occurs over a period of time. Behold, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to their councils and flog you in their synagogues. Why is he saying beware? He's saying these people can be a trouble to you. Don't accept or entrust yourself to them. That's basically what he's saying here. Beware of them. In other words, don't get close. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how to respond or what to say. And in that hour, you will be given what to say. In that hour, you will be given what to say. That's exactly what happened to me. And what's, what was said came right out of my soul, directly into the soul of that man. And he had no power in him that was able to withstand it. And it'll be the same here. These people will not be able to withstand the words that God gives you to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. See, if you're going to practice what you're going to say before you go to talk in a situation like this, before somebody that the Lord is going to put you in front of, before some king or dignitary or something like that, it'll be your flesh practicing. A lot of times what I do is I work a teaching by doing my part, studying beforehand. I do that. But the Holy Spirit is given place to teach. But I do my part in putting the word in me and realizing a form. Sometimes I'm given to go right down that form and sometimes not. It depends on how the Lord has me go. He brings to my mind, shows me how I need to go. 
for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Now he's talking about the last days here as well. Children will rise up against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. How many people can handle that? People hating you. I've experienced this for no reason. But the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. The one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Don't be afraid of people. And that's an easy thing to say, but it's very hard to do. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. Truly, I tell you, you will not reach all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now that's interesting. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher. And that is what we are attaining to. Don't be confused by people who teach you sermons on these greater works, that somehow you're going to be better than Jesus uh, because it's not happening. I believe what the Lord was talking about was that he was one and now we are many. And when you say greater, boy, that's it. It is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher if we could all just be like the Lord and a servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, that's the devil, how much more the members, how much more the members of his household? Why? Why how much more? You got so many more of them. You know, it's one thing to deal with one fly. But what if you've got an entire swarm so thick that you can't even see the sun? Do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed and nothing hidden that will not be made known. Okay, so I had no fear. I was not, I didn't have any fear when that man challenged me. He was challenging my life. And it wasn't personal. <laughs> that doesn't make you feel any better, believe me. But the hidden things were revealed. What that man did not disclose to me was that he was following me, but the Lord disclosed it. The Lord disclosed to me what to do. What I tell you in the dark, speak in daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell, and that is God. We have become and are in the process of becoming a culture that lacks respect for one another because ultimately what began happening was that many in our culture have begun to depart from the respect of God. As the knowledge of God wanes, so does the respect of God and the respect of others, which is what we're experiencing. It's worse in the West, by the way, which is funny. I'm not exactly sure why. It has to do with spiritual entities and what's going on out there. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth much more. You are worth more than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess before him confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Do not assume that I have come to bring peace on the earth. 
Now I know that this is taught repeatedly because it was spoken by the angel at the birth of our Lord. Peace on earth. Peace, peace. But these words are prophetic and they have appointments in time. The peace on earth that was sent in our Lord Jesus is a peace that we are given who receive him with God. We are given a peace with God through Jesus for those of us who receive him. But for the rest of the earth, for those who are not of God, there's no peace. That wasn't what, what Jesus brought. Jesus brought a divider. In a sense, you could call it a sanctifier. Those of us who come to him are sanctified. We are set apart. And Jesus came to bring a sword. He says here, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now, this is another aspect of what he does. He separates us and what is of God from what is not. And it isn't peaceful. It brings warfare. It brings, that's why they hate you. When you've come to the Lord in truth, you will not be lacking for persecution of different sorts. And this I've learned about the enemy. He's creative. And I don't mean creative in that he produces things. He's creative in the way he destroys. He knows different ways to get at you that you can't possibly imagine. And it is diabolical. Well, that's what he is. For I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now that's what he's coming to do on the earth. But there is peace between us and God in heaven now because of our Lord. That is what he brought. So there are different pieces. Peace has different pieces. <laughs> I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn. Now this is a quote of Micah verse 7, chapter 7, excuse me, Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, give this same scripture, and the Lord is quoting it here. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. You have no idea how horrible that feels. Those that you think you love, those that you do love, but Jesus himself says this, if a person doesn't love, well, we're going to get down into here. So hold on. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What are you going to do if your family or, or a certain family members start to hate you? And really, you're going to, you're going to leave everything, leave, all the, the, leave the Lord behind so that you can sadly go after this family member who's chosen to become a stumbling block to you? No, you have to turn away. You're going to have to turn away. That doesn't mean you can't have a say or two to tell them the truth and the way. But you're going to have to turn away. You can't let that stuff occupy your mind. And anyone who does not, but it hurts. That kind of a thing has got a bite to it that very few other things have. It hurts. And that hurt stays with you a long time. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. What? He's talking about the cross. This is Matthew 10. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. And anyone who not, does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That is the death 
of your flesh, the death of your former self, the death of the yeast of hell, the death of that which is fomenting in you, that would draw you away from God, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Everything has to be submitted, which is what we see when we look at the temptations that he was given by the enemy. The body was tempted at a time when he was ravenous. He had to have been absolutely ravenous. He said, man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. By every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. And I have this to say, all the words that have proceeded from the mouth of the Father, of which we have in writing, those are only some of the words that have proceeded from the mouth of the Father, but they are still speaking. They continue to speak because they're alive. Now we have words that he will speak to us personally as we feed on the words that he has spoken that still speak. It's all alive. So anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That means you got to lay your body and your life down. And this happens over a period of time. This isn't a whole, some people do this all at once. I've known of some, that's incredible. But some of us takes a time to lay down, we lay it down in chunks. The best thing is to know that you lay it down and that you keep at it and you persevere until it's all been got. You lay it down for him because he's your life. And whatever you haven't laid down will kill you. That's the truth. It'll destroy you. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will find it. Does that mean that you just go out and kill yourself? Well, that's a misinterpretation of Scripture. You've got to have the Spirit of God to understand this stuff. You definitely have to have the Spirit of God to understand this stuff. So whoever finds his life will lose it. You find your life in Christ. That is the treasure in the field where God begins to show you the territory whereby you get to work that field. But you're your life, you find in Him. It's buried in that field. That's your life in Him. It buried in the field of your heart, buried in the field He gives you to work. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You find it in Him. He gives you what you can't get without Him. He makes you real. You know, I'm going to, I haven't, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but you know, fairy tales are kind of interesting. There's some that have endured through hundreds of years because there's some, there's truth in them. I mean, real truth. We're not talking fantasy truth here. The real truth about how God operates. Pinocchio is one such thing. The story of Pinocchio is very true. It is very true. And whoever found a way to express that gives a little tidbit of how it is with us. You aren't actually real until he has you. You think you are, but you're dead until he has you. You're desperately trying to be alive, and you're looking at all of the, the life, or what appears to be the life around you, and you're imitating it, but you're just dead until he finds you. And then you become alive in Him. So you have to know. And then eventually Pinocchio gets to become a real boy. 
And what's working on Pinocchio is his heart. The love, the love of the father is working on Pinocchio. So Pinocchio is a pretty amazing story. It's scary. There's all kinds of pitfalls. And Pinocchio almost turns into a donkey. He stays on the happy island for too long. And he begins to change. And he is forgetting, see, he had forgotten about the father while he was on the happy, happy island with the bad people. He got to eat anything he wanted, he got to do whatever he wanted, and then, and then there were people that were dominating the little donkeys that were changing, and they were being mean to him. Well, that's life on this earth here. And Jesus comes to bring a sword, and he's going to cut off what's bad. He's going to get rid of it. And you don't want to be part of what he cuts off. You want to be part of what he sanctifies and separates from what is bad. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your sanctifying truth. Thank you for a time spent in fellowship with you. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you for being here right with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for teaching us and growing us to become something incredible that we don't understand and that we won't know until much later. And that's okay. But we hope in what you're doing that we know that what you're doing is great. Somehow we're going to get where we're supposed to go by your spirit. And when we arrive there, well, then we'll be there. But we aren't there right now. We have a long way to go. We hope in you, Lord. Thank you, thank you. And so for all of the hearts that have been with us during this exchange, bless them, sanctify them, continue to teach and develop them, Lord, and grow them up to be the men and women they are supposed to be that they not miss it in any way, that they not step to the right or to the left, but they hear your voice. They hear your voice, and they stay right on point. They endure to the end. In Jesus' name, amen.